This is Michael Steiner from Los Angeles. You're listening to The Candid Frame. Much has been made about bias in the media, especially with respect to politics. But there's also a cultural bias that exists with industrialized and wealthy countries that emphasize the world of technology, social media, celebrity, and disposable incomes. In the age of 24-hour news, the struggles of people trying to maintain a traditional way of life are rarely showcased. But photographer and writer Michael Beninoff has long been fascinated with nomadic people. His first book, Men of Salt, Crossing the Sahara on the Caravan of White Gold, involved him taking a 1,000-mile journey with one of the world's last working camel caravans, hauling salt along ancient trade routes from the heart of the desert to the city of Timbuktu. His latest book, Himalaya Bound, now in paperback, tells the story of another nomadic people in India, the Van Gujar. These people's lives revolve around their herds of buffalo, with whom they migrate annually to their ancestral grazing lands in the Himalayas. However, the conservation efforts in India, including the establishment of national parks, has threatened a way of life that they have practiced for generations. In the Indian situation, each of these Van Gujar families have a meadow up in the Himalayan highlands where they go to, each family goes to their own meadow every summer for year after year, generation after generation. And they don't own the land. Um, it's, it's public land. And some of that land has been turned into national parks. And so when I was with them, a number of these uh, nomadic families were told that they were not going to be allowed into their ancestral meadows ever again, because they were now protected as parkland and was really being set aside for the preservation of fragile wildlife habitat. And this um, conservation model of evicting indigenous people from areas that become national parks, it's really been the dominant conservation model around the world for the past 140, 150 years, ever since it began here in the United States with Yellowstone National Park as the world's first national park. Michael has created a unique niche for his writing and his photography that allows him the chance to travel the world while discovering and sharing the stories of indigenous people and the challenges many of them face sustaining a unique way of life. The experience of losing everything is something that Michael understands personally, as his paternal grandparents lost everything, including family members, while fleeing Bucharest during World War II. There's a direct connection between my personal history and the rights of people being um, taken away or ignored and people being treated as less than human and a real sense of sort of just sort of like a, a built in sense on a cellular level of uh, human justice. I think that comes out of knowing that um, my grandparents came out of a situation where, I mean, their families were murdered. And so <laughs> it, it's a very real thing. And I don't know if it's because of that or or just my personality that I'm attuned to those kind of situations and circumstances. We'll talk to Michael about the obstacles to Van Gujar migration and how it's impacted their social and religious norms and how both photography and writing have allowed him to live a life that he loves. This is Ibadi and X and welcome back to The Candid Frame. All right. Well, Michael, welcome to the show. I'm Thanks. really pleased to have a chance to, to talk with you about your book. But tell me, how does a, a kid born in the Bronx, raised in Connecticut, end up in India with uh, people herding buffalo? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not a very straight path, let's put it that way. Uh, but yeah, no, I've always um, been really interested in nomadic people. I mean, really, since the time I was growing up as a kid, from reading books like biographies of Lawrence of Arabia and other adventure stories like that. And yeah, as I've gotten more into um, traveling and exploring for my own pleasure, as well as part of my work, 
uh, I've really uh, gotten into doing a lot of work with and about nomadic people. And uh, I had been to places like uh, Mongolia and Mali and other parts, parts of the Middle East. And one thing I'd always wanted to do was to actually migrate with a tribe. Through the research that I had done, this one particular tribe uh, that my latest book, uh, Himalaya Bound, uh, is about, they just seem like kind of the ideal tribe to try to migrate with. What, what was the, the fascination early on with nomadic people? What was it about the way that they lived their lives and existed that held such a fascination for you? You know, I really like traveling way off the beaten path. And a lot of times that means walking into very remote places. I'd say early on, maybe this was in the desert in Jordan and out in uh, the mountains and steppes of Mongolia. And I would go out to these places in the middle of nowhere and there would be these people there. And they would be nomads, they'd be living in tents, they'd have herds of goats and sheep or maybe uh, yaks, depending where that was, or camels. The whole way of life was so fascinating. First, that people could actually and did live in these places and thrive in these places. On a personal level, I just find that I'm really happiest when I'm out somewhere in the wilderness, walking and living um, really simply. And that's what nomads do basically all the time. So it, I found it a really kind of a perfect fit for me and just what I enjoy doing and who I enjoy being. Aside from what I just found to be kind of intrinsically fascinating about them, it really dovetailed perfectly with just what I, what I like to do. So how did you basically find a niche for yourself that allowed you to explore these, these worlds, these people, in terms of producing writing, in terms, in terms of pho photography? Because while there is certainly an interest in, in travel, um, most of the travel is often very, very polished, very controlled, <laughs> you know, <Right. laughs> it's, it's sanitized. That's the word I was looking for. Yes. Um, so, you know, in terms of writing, you know, travel articles or travel books, it's really catering to that sort of d demographic, but your interest lies in exploring some less trodden roads. So how did you find a way to serve your needs both as a writer and photographer trying to make a living and also that freed you to you know focus on the things you're really really passionate about well i'm really bad at doing things that i don't want to do <laughs> and so <laughs> the only way that i could actually both travel and make a living doing this kind of stuff was really focusing on what i most wanted to do parallel to that uh, i had ended up uh, working with a guy, helping him put his memoirs together, who had once been the managing editor of the New York Times, uh, a man named Arthur Gelb, who started out at the Times in the 1940s as a copy boy and worked his way up through uh, reporter and editor to finally become managing editor. Because he and I became close in the process of working on his memoirs, he introduced me to some of the editors at the Times when I first began really writing for national publications, because I think probably because I had his personal blessing, um, you know, he took me into the office of the travel editor and said, oh, I hired her 20 years ago. I'll introduce you to her and let's see what happens. And so because I think I had that kind of personal introduction, I could pitch them stories that were maybe not quite mainstream uh, and they would be willing to consider them. And so that's kind of how that all got started. Once you begin, or once I began building up um, my resume, my portfolio, then, you know, you build little by little and things begin to fall into place. You know, when, when it comes to photography, a lot of photographers focus on finding and developing their style. Mm -hmm. And I think the same goes for being a writer. It's not just slogging around a bunch of words and Maybe right. some pretty sentences. So, and sometimes I think it's it's more difficult to find your voice as a writer than than as a, as a photographer, especially when you're making a living and you're subject to another editor's taking your words and massaging them and changing them in whatever way. Yeah, uh, tell me about the process of finding your voice as as a writer because it's it's really beautiful and clear in the book. Uh, oh, and then there are moments, uh, there's a moment in here that I just highlighted just because I just thought it was just a beautifully uh, rendering uh, paragraph. But I know that that's not easy to come by. 
Thanks. Um, yeah, no, I'm not one of these, uh, uh, I don't know, geniuses mm-hmm. that can just sit down and throw things on the page and it's perfect mm-hmm. uh, the first time out. I, I do find that as simple as it sounds, one of the hardest things to do in writing is to actually say what you mean. Mm. For me, I also find because in doing travel writing, I'm a character in the story to a certain degree. One of the hardest things is really creating that character of myself in a way that is both true and authentic while not being entirely complete. Because then if you were to do that, you would have every book would be Zen and the art of buffalo herding yeah. or Zen and the art of camel riding. Because, you know, everything that's going on in our head, you can't write everything that's happening in your head. So you kind of have to create a character that is you and that is true while leaving some stuff out because it would just, you know, open the rabbit hole for meaninglessness yeah. in an attempt to be meaningful. So, yeah, no, I, I, and I think over time, my style has changed somewhat while also staying true to itself at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciated the way you sort of honestly rendered yourself as a character in the book. Uh, There was was one moment that stuck out for me is when you were traveling and the group that you were traveling with, which was largely two families, uh, were in need of water. And you guys came, came to a place that was, I guess, under construction. Oh, yeah. And uh, you were, at, and you said, well, we can go over there. I noticed a hose and ask them for water. And the people you were with are very reluctant to do it. And so you, you managed to do, to ask them. And the guy who was there gave you a little tour and told you, feel free to, to use the hose. And the, the, the people you were with are very reluctant to get as much water as they actually needed. And they, and they made the point that if they had not been with you, a white man, that they would not have received as generous a reception. And that that was sort of a surprise for you. And I, and I really appreciated you acknowledging that and putting that in, in, in the book, because I think that is a reality that, 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 that needs to be put out there, especially in a book that is sort of exploring the life of, 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 a, of a culture, of a people, but from the perspective of someone of a privilege. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just, I'm not sure, um, to, give, to give a little bit of background to the situation, uh, when that scene takes place, I'm documenting the migration of this tribe, this, in particular, these couple of families of nomadic buffalo herders uh, in India. And we're traveling in this stretch of the migration by road. And so we're camped along the road, but the nearest public water source is about maybe half a mile or so away. So they are going to have to go and collect this water and then carry it back to where we're camped. While directly across the road, there's, as you said, this building going up and there's a hose. And so it strikes me as obvious that we should just go across, directly across the road, ask the guy if we can use the water from the hose, and it shouldn't be a big deal. Um, But yeah, the family was very hesitant to do so. uh, And they wouldn't go across unless I was with them. I mean, for me, I think even in the writing of it, there was the dilemma of not knowing, were they absolutely right in their assessment of the situation? And that if, you know, due to the social um, structure of life in India, would it have been totally inappropriate for them to go across and ask this guy to use his water? And would he only have really given it to them because I was there? Or were they making assumptions about him? And maybe he would have given them the water anyways. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where there's no way to know. And I just had to trust, you know, that they had a deep understanding of the situation that to me was something that I wasn't able to see on the surface because it's their world. Yeah. Well, let's give uh, listeners a a brief overview of, of the people. How do you pronounce the name of, of this group of people? The tribe, um, they're called Von Gujars. Von Gujars. So it's two separate words. Von is spelled like a van you would drive around in. And Gujar uh, is the second part of that. Yeah. Could you give us a brief description of, of who these people are and and briefly what um, their lives revolve around in this, in this area and what this migration uh, that they take yearly is, is all about? Yeah, so the Van Gujars, um, they are... They live in northern India, and they're what's called forest-dwelling nomads. 
And that means that traditionally, they're always living somewhere out in the wilderness, uh, in the jungles, in the mountains. They never live in a town or in a village. And they herd water buffaloes. Um, and that's really their entire lives revolve around the care and the well-being of their herds of buffaloes. They use the buffaloes almost completely for the milk that they produce. Uh, even though this tribe is uh, a Muslim community, they're also vegetarian, not because of any religious restrictions, but because they love animals so much, in particular their own animals, that they just don't want to kill them and they don't want to eat them. Mm -hmm. They don't, with their own buffaloes, they think of them like family members uh, and they would never eat one or sell one for slaughter. Um, they have really deep personal relationships with these animals. And they move with the seasons as many nomadic people do. So in the, um, in the cooler months, in the fall and winter, they live in these lowland jungle hills. Uh, but then in the spring and summer, when it gets ridiculously hot, then they move up into the Himalayas, to these high alpine meadows where, where they graze their animals all summer long. And really every element of their life revolves around taking care of these buffaloes that sustain them uh, with the milk that they produce and also that they really have kind of profound emotional connections with. And what was really fascinating and completely new to me was how the efforts to for protection of the forest and how it's been basically modeled after the United States is uh, policies for protecting uh, places like Yellowstone and, you know, all these places have sort of influenced countries all over the world to model themselves after, after what we've done in the United States, but also with the sometimes unintended or intended impact right. of, of impacting ind indigenous people who have been using those very same locations for, for centuries, because that was like one of the, the tensions in the book was whether or not they were going to be able to go to, to the very meadows that they had been using for God knows how many generations. Yeah, absolutely. And in the Indian situation, each of these Van Gujar families have a meadow up in the Himalayan highlands where they go to, each family goes to their own meadow every summer for year after year, generation after generation. And they don't own the land. Um, it's, it's public land. And some of that land has been turned into national parks. And so when I was with them, a number of these uh, nomadic families were told that they were not going to be allowed into their ancestral meadows ever again because they were now protected as parkland and was really being set aside for the preservation of fragile wildlife habitat. This um, conservation model of evicting indigenous people from areas that become national parks, it's really been the dominant conservation model around the world uh, for the past 140, 150 years ever since it began here in the United States with Yellowstone National Park as the world's first national park. I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, back in the day, that was a place that was really important to Native American people. And that they, once it became a national park, uh, the tribes that used that area were pushed out by the U.S. Army. And I mean, the same thing happened in Glacier National Park and Yosemite uh, and around the world. Today, there are tens of millions of uh, what are called conservation refugees, um, indigenous people who have been evicted from their traditional lands once those places become national parks or wildlife sanctuaries. Yeah. So it's really this unfortunate and sort of tragically ironic collateral damage to protecting uh, wild places that really may not need to happen. Yeah, because they, they idealize these locations and feel like its pristineness, it can only be achieved by restricting restricting access of people. But then, right. but by pulling out these people and their normal use of that environment in ways that in which they were much more sensitive to sort of the ebb and flows of those locations, actually was contributing to the health of it. And then once you remove those people, all of a sudden things unanticipated impacts result, where you know, the countries or the governments are making efforts to try and restore that balance that has been lost as a result of taking out the people. So it's just... 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like there's, it really is rooted in a Western perspective in which people don't belong in the wilderness and can never be an integral part of a natural ecosystem. Uh, and so there's a complete failure to appreciate that not only were these indigenous people, you know, sort of living more, maybe more gently on the land, but they were really a key part of these ecosystems and a key part of what keeps them in balance in the way that we understand them. And so by taking people off the land, it's quite possible that what you'll, what ends up happening is those ecosystems get thrown out of balance even more than if people were left there to just live the, the way that they've lived for the past, you know, thousand, two thousand, three thousand years. Okay. How were how you introduced to the family who you traveled with? Before I went over there, I got in touch with a nonprofit organization that was based in the region that did some work with and advocated for that particular tribe. And I wrote to them and said, you know, here's who I am. This is what I want to do. Is this even possible? Uh, and the director of the NGO wrote back and he said, yeah, sure. You know, come on over and we'll introduce you to a family. And it's up to them if they decide that you can go with them or not. Uh, but we'll open that door for you and at least make an introduction. So I went into the forest for the first time with uh, both a translator and somebody from uh, that nonprofit organization and met with the family and talked to them for a while. And they were completely open to the idea. And they really actually liked the idea that somebody was going to tell their story to the rest of the world because they felt like they were being you know, oppressed by the government and nobody was paying attention to them. Yeah. Well, that journey is not easy. Uh, it's no. all on foot and you don't get any of the benefits of modern technology. You're traveling along with them. You know, you're on foot. You're dealing with the rains. You're dealing with the mud. You're dealing with those treacherous roads. You even, you know, become a, a wrangler of water buffalo at, at, at several points during, uh -huh. during the travels. Uh, did you have any sense of what you were in for and how did you prepare for it? I wasn't really sure what was going to be happening on a day-to-day -day basis. But what I knew for sure was that it was not going to be anywhere near as difficult as what I did for my first book, uh, in which I went across the Sahara with one of the world's last working camel caravans. That trip was physically brutal. Crossing the Sahara with this caravan, there were many days where we were on the trail going through really the oldest and the driest part of the Sahara, uh, we'd be traveling for 20 hours a day, nonstop, uh, which meant that maybe we'd have an hour or two to sleep, an hour to eat, you know, one meal, and then we're back on the trail again, day after day after day. So that was grueling. And I knew whatever was going to happen here with this tribe in the Himalayas was not even going to come close to being that brutal. So I wasn't too wow. worried about surviving <laughs> that. Um, because, you know, with these Saharan camel caravans there, it's men who are on a mission to, this is, they're bringing salt back from this mine in the middle of the desert back to uh, the city of Timbuktu. And so for them, it's serious business and they move really fast. They want to get in and out of this area uh, and survive. Whereas traveling with uh, this tribe in India, we were traveling with entire families and young children and whole herds of animals. And so even though it was difficult, I knew that it was going to be much more relaxed <laughs> um, <laughs> compared to traveling with a camel caravan in the Sahara. One of the, one of the funny lines in the book is when you were doing something, I don't know if you're bringing a big bunch of firewood or something, and then and you sort of prided yourself that now you recognize yourself as strong as a 14-year-old girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The people in the tribe are, they're so strong. They're so agile. And I mean, compared to anybody, I was trying to rate myself to see how strong am I compared to these people. And yeah, after several weeks, I finally realized I was about on the level of the 14 year old daughter. Yeah. So one of the things that's that's happening with 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 these people as they're restricted in their ability to be able to go to these in these meadows that they are used to going to that they're now being pressured to adopt village living 
in which they're going to be living in communities. And, and that is having a really big impact in terms of the culture. And one of the things that you noted is, is the fact that uh, the way that they practice their religion, which is uh, uh, they're, they're Muslim, is being influenced by the fact that they, they are now being influenced by people who are much more conservative. And that was a really fascinating observation to make, that, that this is not just depriving these people of a way of life, but that it's fundament, fundamentally changing the way they practice religion, culture, and that uh, the issues of, of differences in class, religion, because India is largely Hindu, I mean, definitely gender rights as and well. And gender rights, and all of that is being impacted by this one thing. You think you're conservating in a, a natural environment, but that has an immediate and a lasting impact that I think many people would never consider. Oh, definitely. I mean, for forever, the Van Gujars were just living out in the forest, and they would have some contact with the outside world, but nobody really knew about them. Nobody really knew who they were. And so they were able to live and practice their own version of Islam for centuries. And their version of Islam was incredibly liberal. Uh, the women are essentially equal to the men. And, you know, they pray when they feel like it. Um, and they really consider, traditionally, they consider all religions equal in that God is kind of just another word for nature. But once they started being pushed out of the forest, and being settled in villages, then all of a sudden people knew who they were they be, and they became accessible to other forces. So, you, so conservative imams um, came into the community once, it was, once the people were evicted and settled and said, oh, well, you know, if you actually want to be a good Muslim, then you're supposed to do this and you're not supposed to do that. And of course, they wanted to be good Muslims. And so they began to adopt some of these more conservative um, ideas, uh, which included affecting the gender roles, uh, included promoting the idea of eating meat instead of being vegetarian, and all other um, uh, aspects of the culture were, were touched by this. And because you have the settled villagers who are changing their ways, word is also filtering into the Vangujars who are still living nomadically in the forest and changing that world a little bit as well. Uh, one of the daughters in the family that I was with, she had been married to, she had been in, set up in an arranged marriage uh, to somebody who had already been evicted from the forest and was living in a village. So she had spent some time with him uh, in his village. And she said, living in a village is like being in prison. And I think part of that was because of the lack of freedoms in general. I think part of that was because of this more conservative mindset, because her family still was part of this more liberal world. She was able to leave her husband and divorce him. And it, for her, it wasn't a problem. She was able to remarry, you know, without any sort of stigmatization against her for having been divorced. But I'm not sure how long that, you know, sort of liberal attitude towards divorce will exist um, over the years in this culture as it becomes more conservative. Yeah. Later on in the, in the book, I think, I don't know if it's her or another one talks about, you know, why they in love to living where they do and living the way that they do. And, you know, the beauty of the environment, the respect that they have for their animals, for each other. And, you know, from Western eyes, they would look at these people as living so primitively and thinking, well, they would benefit so much from an education, modern technology, all these things that we we glorify in 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 our own world. But these people have some of the very things that that people who have all those things pine over. It's it's amazing how many people in the midst of the internet that promises all this connectivity uh, still create lives that are largely isolated and lonely. And these, for these people, that's that's probably something they don't even can't even fathom as a result of that their all of their lives from the children to the oldest uh, man in, in the group are so reliant and dependent on each other. Yeah, I mean, at one point, you know, I had imagined, oh, what would it be like to marry one of these Vangujar women and take her back to America? And I couldn't even. It, to me, the idea seemed actually actually cruel, rather than hmm. offering her this like wonderful life you know, full of American things, separating her from her family and from her community and the close connection that they have, 
seemed like it, it wouldn't be a price worth paying, uh, even for those kinds of benefits. Yeah, and, and in their case, the reality is if they were to leave the forest and settle down in the village and try to adopt more modern ways, it's not like they could walk out of the forest and step into some tech job or something like that. Um, these are, they're illiterate, uh, they're Muslim, they'd be coming out into real world India, and it would mean they would become, you know, essentially day laborers working for, you know, 50 cents, a dollar a day doing difficult manual labor, where, where they are in the forest, they live lives of dignity and freedom, and they are their own bosses. Uh, and they have their families, and they have their animals, and they love the way that they live. So that real-life trade-off between living in the forest with freedom and dignity and moving into a village and you know, likely becoming day laborers working for a dollar a day, it's not that hard to see why they prefer to stay in the forest. Yeah. For the first time, I'm trying to earn a nomination slot for the annual podcast awards in the categories of art and the people's choice. I've never tried this before, but I thought I'd finally give it a go this year. You can help me do that by going to podcastawards.com, register on the site, and place a vote for the candidate frame in the arts and people choice categories. If at the end of the month I have enough votes, I'll be one of several podcasts that can be voted on to win in their respective categories, which would be nice after so many years of being around. So go to podcastawards.com, register, and put your vote in, and let's see what happens. Thanks. Help the Candid Frame to continue bringing you great conversations with some of the world's best photographers. You can do this by supporting our Patreon effort by committing as little as $5 or more a month. When you do this, you not only help us to meet the cost of production, but provide us the time and resources we need to bring you conversations you won't hear anywhere else. Sign up today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Thank you. I think one of the, the greatest talents a photographer or a writer can have is that of observation. And there's a paragraph in here that I want to read because I just, it's the paragraph that I mentioned earlier where you're uh -huh. describing um, a location where you have, have, and you say, despite these challenges, there was a magical aura to this place. With the sun filtering through the forest canopy, we moved in an ethereal world of emerald flecked with gold. The spongy moss covering ancient boulders, the grasses in a tangle like windswept hair and the vines and creepers curling over bony deadfall, the leaves shimmering, quaking on bushes and trees, the long, elegant needles crowning old, majestic pines. It was all infused with such a rich and dreamy glow. I half expected to encounter nymphs of fairies while I was gathering firewood or fetching water from a creek. And I just, I just love that. I reread that paragraph several, several times over. And um, I, I love the fact that you were that observant to pick up on such a detail, especially since you were often involved in just getting from point A to point B every day, which I no doubt was, you know, physically exhausting. And you were both accumulating material for which you would write the book, but you were also making photographs. And that call, all of that calls for a different degree of energy. Absolutely. You know, to be able to be focused enough to know what you need to write notes about and also what's, what's, what needs to be photographed. Yeah. So tell me about juggling all of that simultaneously, because sometimes I think just photographing alone is exhausting, much less <laughs> everything else that you were trying to do at the same time. Yeah. Um, somehow doing writing and shooting works for me and they require really two different ways of perceiving any situation and so I think sometimes there are probably going to be some shots that I miss and probably there are going to be um, sometimes some observational details that maybe I also miss but for the most part, I find I'm able to balance looking at the world as a writer and also as a photographer. 
uh, I've decided not even to try to do video because I can't add, oh. I know I can't add one more thing into that. That's a whole other perspective that it, it, that would be too much for me. Um, maybe some people can do it. I can't, <laughs> but um, in scenes like the one that you mentioned, it was so, um, I, I was grabbed by the moment. It didn't take any work to actually notice that because it was so magically enveloping um, you know, as I describe, that it demanded I pay attention to it. Uh, the times that are harder is when you're not really sure what's going on or where there's sort of a monotony uh, to the rhythm. But those big moments, they're easier to pay attention to. And then uh, I'm, I don't try to actually write um, full paragraphs like that while I'm in the field. I'll just take notes, but very specific notes, because it's in those details where the writing comes alive. Yeah. So you, know, you had to minimize how much equipment you took with with you. So you weren't turning around a laptop or anything like that. I, I would oh, no. imagine. So, uh, so you have a you have a camera. You have notebooks, both of which you have to protect. So yeah. talk to me about what you would take and how you chose to protect it, because you noted several times in the book. Sometimes the downpour of rain was just fierce and unrelenting. Yeah. Um, well, Ziploc bags work for notebooks uh, pretty well. And the camera, I just tried to be as careful with it as I could. I mean, I, had, I was shooting mainly with one body and then I had a backup body that I just kept totally wrapped up and in the bag in case my main body failed. Uh, but I wasn't shooting with two bodies simultaneously, I think ever, uh, cause I didn't, it was just more convenient to keep it buried in the bag. And I am trying to remember, I think I had, yeah, I had three lenses with me. That was it. Just one zoom lens and two primes and this one body. So I really kept my gear to a minimum, kept it wrapped, kept it in, you know, just padded uh, cases and hoped that hope for the best. Yeah. Did, did photography become a part of your part of your repertoire to help with being able to market the writing? Not originally. Um, you know, when I first started writing for big publications like the Times, back in those days, it was actually pretty rare for somebody to both write and shoot a story. There was a real prejudice that writers couldn't shoot and photographers couldn't write. Um, and at one point, actually, I think this was a story for the Christian Science Monitor. The story editor told me that she told the photo editor that, I was a photographer who she was allowing to write the story because if I was a writer who was taking pictures, I would get paid less for the pictures. <laughs> so, but back in the day um, when publications had more money, they really liked to have separate people writing and shooting. And I think I really was only allowed to do what I did in doing both because a lot of times I was going to such remote places that nobody wanted to pay to send somebody else there if I could do both myself. Uh, and my pictures were good enough to start with. And then that's how that really became part of something that I began to develop. And then really since this trip with the Van Gujars, when I saw how integral the images were to the story and what they added in a way that, that, my writing couldn't. I've really begun to balance the writing and the photography almost 50-50 as storytelling tools uh, because both bring really important elements to storytelling. And I try to maximize the strengths of both and use them both now equally. It was really interesting because I read through the book before I started looking at the images on the site. Uh -huh. And it was, it was kind of... Uh, really fascinating to, it was like I was recognizing people. Oh, I was raising exactly, any experiences right. <laughs> and it was, oh, this is this person. Oh, this and um, it was really nice as, as a compliment. I mean, you exactly. could appreciate the book for what it is. You could appreciate the photographs for what it is, but it was really nice to sort of compliment it. Because sometimes I think the photography is often looked at as simply illustrative, mm -hmm. that it's secondary to, to the text and the words. But here, I felt like uh, it was a nice synergy between the two of them. Thanks. Yeah. And I feel like in the work that I'm doing now, I've really become relying. I, I really began relying more 
on photography to do the work that I once might have used writing for, Mm -hmm. but still at the same time, the writing is a crucial component. Um, I mean, I think for example, like in the photos from the book, there's something about being able to look at the people who are, who are my companions, my friends, look into their faces, look into their eyes and you get a sense of who those people are in a way that goes beyond words while at the same time, getting their backstory fills in everything else about it. Uh, And so trying to use those two elements in that complementary way uh, is something that I'm continuing to play with and use and um, try to just tell stories in the most effective way possible. Yeah. When you're writing or you're making photographs and you accumulate a body of work, uh, especially on, on a project, uh, it's not always the best thing. Well, it's, I don't think it's ever the right thing to immediately dive in and try to shape it, put it all together, whether it's as a portfolio or a finished article or a book. There needs to be a time where you allow yourself some distance and a basically a gestation period before you can allow it to sort of take the shape that it's meant, meant to take. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, it took a while between you having that experience and, and the book coming out, but I'm more focused on you actually creating something from that. And mm-hmm. if you could walk us through what that experience was like, because as, as, as richly detailed as the book is, I'm sure there was a lot left out and a, a variety of things that you had to sort of shape and reshape in order for it to, to work as well as it does. Well, I definitely had time in between when I actually was on the migration and wrote the book. This whole pathway to publication was very indirect. At the same time, the important elements of the story, those really never changed in my mind. Uh, And so, and because I had all of the notes from that time, I was, I was able to walk through it in a sense that was both felt very immediate while having some perspective on the experience that, that the time allowed me. Uh, I think one thing that was different about this book than some of my previous books was that I came into this book with really clinging to the idea that no matter how much I describe a situation, each person who reads it is going to picture something different in their head. So even the passage that you read, maybe everybody who's listening to that has a different picture of what that looks like. And so I would add those kind of descriptive paragraphs here and there scattered throughout the book to bring people into the place. But I use them in a much more limited way than I might have in the past, because I felt like I can just add a few words here and a few words there to trigger the imaginations of the reader and let them imagine the scene as they're going to see it, rather than having to try to spell out every single detail. Because even if I do that, everybody's going to imagine a completely different scene anyways. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to, um, and it'll just keep the pace of the book moving along. So I tried to do that in a way that allowed the book and the narrative to unfold naturally and be told in a way that felt organic and plant the seeds in people's minds to let them imagine this, this world as fully as possible. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, it makes perfect sense to me. (laughs) Because of the span between the events, because those happen, uh, the events uh, in the book happened around 2009, and so yeah. it's about 10, 10 years ago. Um, how have things changed, evolved in terms of of these people's ability to be able to access those those metals and those fields and be able to migrate with their buffalo? Is it status quo? Are, are they increasingly not being able to access? What's what's exactly the the situation now, 10 years later? Well, at the time that I was with them in 2009, there was a real push uh, to keep these tribe, the, these families out of their Himalayan meadows. And in the years that have followed since then, the family that I was with, they have been allowed to go back to their ancestral meadow because there's a law that essentially says they need to be allowed to go to their meadow. Uh, it's called the Forest Rights Act. And essentially it protects the rights of forest dwelling people to continue living on their land, even if it becomes national park. Uh, But the law itself is very inconsistently implemented. 
Uh, sometimes it's completely deliberately ignored. So just the fact that the law is there doesn't really give them a whole lot of security. So they've been allowed to go back officially, but each year the government still throws hurdles up in their way and still tries to pressure them not to go up there. Uh, and so it's almost like rather than um, overtly evicting them, they're just trying to sort of gradually erode their spirit and make their lives more and more and more difficult uh, to eventually just tacitly coerce them into a different way of life. Yeah, because the, uh, the, s- the stress of the patriarch of the, of the first family, how do you say his name? Oh, uh, Duman. Duman. Yeah. When you guys reach that, basically that, literally that fork in the road where you have to decide whether he's going to, whether they're going to go down the traditional path to get to those, those familial uh, meadows or go somewhere else is really a palpable one because there's oh, just yeah. so much, there's so much is like, what, what do we do? And I can imagine that the, the level of anxiety that you, that he and everyone in the family felt and probably have felt in subsequent years is incredibly taxing because it's not just a minor inconvenience. It has a huge impact in terms of the sustainability of the family, their, their water buffalo, um, whether or not they can continue this way of life. Just th- there's so much at stake there that it, I, I, just, I felt tense just reading it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they really felt like, I mean, their immediate lives and livelihood as well as their whole way of life was kind of hanging in the balance here. They had no idea what was going to happen. And by the end of the migration, many people in the family just felt like all sense of security in this way of life that their, their culture has practiced for thousands of years had really been ripped out from underneath them. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of uncertainty, I mean, it's, it it really rattled people in the family in a, in a profound way. Well, you wrote several other books, one of which was um, a history of your paternal grandparents uh-huh. and how they met uh, as a result of events of World War II, particularly the, the, the Holocaust. Yeah. And they were both people who basically lost everything and yeah. had to rebuild their lives literally from, from scratch. And in reading that about uh, your family, I was wondering whether that, that reality of your grandparents has instilled in you a sensitivity to people who can and do lose everything. Do you think that that is part of what makes you sort of sensitive to, 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 to these people like the men in the Sahara or these people in, in India? Uh, For sure. I mean, I think there's a immediate realization that there's a direct connection between my personal history and the rights of people being um, taken away or ignored and people being treated as less than human uh, and a real sense of sort of just sort of like a a built in sense on a cellular level of uh, human justice. I think that comes out of knowing that um, my grandparents came out of a situation where, I mean, their families were murdered and so it, it's a very real thing. And I'm very, I, I don't know if it's because of that or, or just my personality that I'm attuned to those kind of situations and circumstances. So when you write these books and you write these magazine articles, you, you're, you're hoping to educate people and, and, and make them aware of something that they were otherwise sort of oblivious to. Um, but beyond that, what, what is your hope for any and all the work that you, that you produce? Well, I think there's two things. And one is, um, let's say, for example, with this tribe in India and their situation, to raise awareness about that and to kind of shine a light on the problems that they're facing and hope that somebody pays attention and you know, maybe create some kind of solutions for them. Uh, on a different level, what I'm really interested in doing is telling stories both through words and images that expand the mind of the people who see those stories and make their world a bigger place to live in and walk around in. I mean, your world is different 
when you know that, oh, there are these nomadic water buffalo herders living in the jungles in India and going up to the Himalayas, or, oh, there are these people crossing the Sahara Desert, bringing salt back from the middle of it on the backs of camels, um, all of a sudden the world is a bigger, richer place. And that is really fundamental to what I'm trying to do with my work is not just raise awareness about issues that are happening in the world, but um, just sort of expand or blow the minds of the people who are taking in these stories. Yeah. I, when I was reading the book, I was here in my studio and I'm sitting in my reading chair and then, you know, look up and I look at everything that I have in the space, you know, the computers, the cameras, the speakers, the lights and all that other stuff. And I'm going, this is a fortune. Oh yeah. You know, as compared <laughs> to what these people, people have. And I go, wow, you know, I, I got a lot of stuff, but you know, these people, um, you know, have have something that's priceless, right? Absolutely. People talk about when they lose all their stuff to fire or an earthquake or stuff, they, they always go back to their family's okay. You know, the, right. all this stuff. And it's so easy to forget living in a Western culture just because you're completely inundated with, with this idea that the stuff that we own is what is the measure of our worth. And, right. And, and one of the main things about um, the Van Gujars is that because they live in the forest, they're so attuned to living in balance with the natural environment. I mean, mm -hmm. they actually know how to live on this planet successfully in a way that we are, you know, we've put our, the entire world at risk because we've forgotten how to do that. Um, you know, the people in the Sahara Desert, one reason why I took that trip was because this ancient caravan culture was rumored to be dying out because in the past in the years previous, trucks had begun running this ancient salt trading route. So, of course, it would be like this sort of Saharan John Henry story, you know, like trucks versus camels. And, of yeah. course, trucks would win. But once I was over there, I learned that that actually wasn't the case because the tribal leaders got together and they knew that so many of these families depended on the camel trade. So, they arranged it so that truckers could participate and they could take a certain share of the salt and camel families could would continue to participate and they get a certain share of the salt because they knew that their whole system would collapse if it was kind of a winner take all yeah. situation and again there's a lesson on how to live on this planet with people all together that they have remembered and for all of our modern conveniences and luxuries we could use the reminder <laughs> yeah uh as of this recording last week google calendar went down last week and on twitter i was you know trying to figure out what was going on and, and the, the the full spread panic how am i supposed <laughs> to figure out what i'm supposed to do today and, it was right. like, and i was like wow man that's a real matter of perspective you know it's just like right. i was so reliant and it disappears and all of a sudden we just don't know what to do next yeah. Where with them, they're const they, they, they don't dwell on the fact that there's something going wrong. It's that they immediately have to figure out a, a solution for it. Yeah. They, they don't have the benefit of getting on their phone and complaining on Twitter that it's raining exactly. too long. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they know how to manage it. They know how to deal with it. I mean, things happen, mm -hmm. but that's, you know, that's life. Yeah. They, they accept that. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Yeah, somebody who I've recently uh, discovered. Right now I'm finishing up a project uh, about Kashmir. And so one Kashmiri photographer who I've been paying attention to is a young woman named Mastrat Zahra. And she is an early 20s photojournalist based in Srinagar. On the one hand, you could say she simply photographs life in Kashmir. But what that also means is that maybe one day, you know, she's photographing shepherds. And the next day, she's a conflict photographer because that's what's mm, happening there. Yeah. And so the range of subjects that she's covering in conveying life in Kashmir, in particular, the conflict um, between Kashmiris who would like to be free of India and Indian armed forces. I mean, it's, uh, sh she opens up a window into that world that um, I enjoy looking through. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for the book and just for sitting down and talking with me. I really enjoyed chatting with you. 
Oh, absolutely. Thanks. No, I'm glad uh, we did this and I'm glad you like the book so much. Thanks to Michael for sharing his time and story with us. You can find out more about him and his work by visiting michaelbeninov.com. And remember that his book, Himalaya Bound, is now available in paperback. You'll find a link to purchase it through Amazon using our affiliate link, but it's also available anywhere you buy books. And I'm going to be in Vancouver, British Columbia at the end of August, conducting a workshop with my friend and fellow photographer, Olaf Staba. It's going to be a great experience in a beautiful part of Canada. Come out and join us for this two and a half day workshop that's sure to be amazing. Find out more by clicking the link in the show notes and the website. My latest book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is available. Purchase it today and receive 40% off the list price when you order it from the Rocky Nook website. Use the promo code Pirello40 at checkout to take advantage of the discount. And you can receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks by signing up for the Candid Frame mailing list, where I share thoughts about life, photography, and keep you updated on TCF events. If you enjoy the show, help to spread the word by writing a review wherever you find and listen to podcasts. And if you write a review on a blog post, let me know and send me a link because I really would like to thank you on air. Thanks to Colin Corneau from Canada, Scott11970 from the US, and Paul Neville from Australia for their recent five-star reviews. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, or you can make a one-time contribution via PayPal. You'll find the links for both in the show notes and the website. Thanks to Sandra Sugawara and Zoltan Puskas for their recent contributions. And if you want to easily access every episode of The Candid Frame, download the Candid Frame app. It's available for Apple iOS and Android, and it's free. And if you scroll down on the app, you'll find a free excerpt of my book that you can download. And we also have an Alexa app. So if you have one of those smart devices, download the skill and listen to the show that way. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.